Thank you for joining us today. We're here to talk about how to build a marketing taxonomy. My name is Michael Shear. I am the Senior Director of Digital Innovation and Strategy at Clarivine, and I'm here with Christine Regis. Christine, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, Christine Regis. I'm the Director of Solution Consulting at Clarivine. We've been with the company two years now. Christine, can you tell the audience a little bit about what you do for Clarivine and our customers? Sure. So my role is really to come in and help clients evaluate their technical uh, landscape, understand some of the challenges that they're facing, and put forth sort of the, a recommended approach for implementation. Um, so really involved in the initial uh, scoping and implementation of Clarivine for clients. Since we're talking about marketing taxonomy, I'm sure the audience who's watching wants to know a little bit about what that is. So in your own words, could you describe marketing taxonomy? Sure. Um, so it's funny because I feel like the term marketing taxonomy or even just taxonomy gets thrown around a lot, especially in my role and I'm sure in your world as well. Um, the way that I would describe it is it is a definition for anything within marketing. So it's not just a tracking code, even though that's a very common use case. It could be applied to a product catalog digital assets, your asset management tool. Um, it's a set definition of data that you want to capture that's associated with that given data point or that key. Um, and really the benefit of having a defined marketing taxonomy is those data points that you're defining up front are then leveraged in either cross-functional marketing tactics and optimizations or even just the analysis of performance and optimization. Awesome. How would you describe it? I would describe a marketing taxonomy as a, again, it's kind of a data dictionary. It is a, it is the unifying of key marketing assets. And generally the example I give when talking about it is the four C's content, campaigns, catalogs, and coupons. These, are four key marketing assets. They all have each one, each asset has a ton of fields, metadata, you know, so to speak, associated with it. And so it's this mapping of fields and values, not just underneath in each asset, but across these different assets. So being able to have the interconnectedness of, again, campaigns, content, coupons, catalogs, et cetera. When you're able to standardize and connect those things, you can do a whole lot more with your marketing, you know, everything you're doing in marketing. Yeah, building a solid data foundation. So you talked a little bit about it when defining a marketing taxonomy, but can you expand on the value of building one and applying one? At the most fundamental level, um, it's the optimization ability. Um, because you're collecting more data points and more standardized data points. Um, so your ability to optimize off of all of those various points that you're now collecting um, is just further enriched. And then additionally, it's the insights that you get. So for analyzing performance, product performance, asset performance, um, you're able to sort of pull different le levers with more confidence um, and based off of the data that you're now collecting. Makes sense. What do you see as the benefit? On, on top of what you describe, I think one of the important things that people need to understand is that when you have everybody working from a marketing taxonomy, that you are going to be more agile because you aren't worried about what values to set up. These things are pre predetermined, they're ready to go, you apply them and you can move on. So there's this, you create a culture of agility and collaboration. And I think that that's the thing, yes, data quality is important. Building trust in your data is hugely important, but there is this collaboration and culture of agility that can be created once you are all playing, you know, working from the same taxonomy playbook. And so I think that's really important for everybody to understand. Yeah. And I think it's a good point, the, the playbook and having those definitions in a agreed upon centralized environment. Um, you know, you think about how marketing tech, 
uh, technology has evolved over the years and organizations, I mean, as great as they are, how as agile as they are and organized, um, you're still susceptible of loss in knowledge as the organization matures, adopts new technologies. So that's a lot of the time what causes just discrepancies in data and the lack of taxonomies is just the natural change and progression of um, growth in technology. Yeah, I mean, uh, talking about the growth of technology, we have been bombarded with marketing technology over the past decade or so. And I think that the reason why marketing taxonomy is becoming more of an issue and something that people are finally addressing is because we're, they're bursting at the seams with technology that is not integrated, not talking to each other. And there's a certain point where you have to stop, step back, reset your data strategy. And that, I mean, resetting the data strategy for marketing starts with building and, you know, taxonomy, your data definitions, and then getting everybody to play from it. Because it means for smaller businesses, it's maybe not as applicable, but when you're an enterprise, you're doing global marketing, you have 20, 30 plus teams, hundreds of people touching that data. You can't have a you know concerted marketing program without, without this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, to your point, it's kind of funny. We joke within our team that what we do isn't necessarily the most exciting to everyone. Um, and it's funny when we're talking about marketing technology and to your point, like the, the it's kind of like the new toy in the room or the, the shiniest object gets everyone's attention. Well, the heavy lifting that really has to happen in order to use those technologies efficiently is the not so exciting work. Right. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's a funny sort of parallel. It's oftentimes an afterthought. And I think now, especially with like all of the privacy concerns going on and the changes Apple's making, the changes Google's making, a lot of people and companies, I think, are looking under the hood. Um, yeah. And we see that, I mean, yeah. all the time. Um, and really focusing on getting their first party data in order because that's, you know, critical, especially now. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be more they're going to have to restructure their data. Like this isn't just to solve the problems of old that were created from rapidly implementing technology without setting the foundation first, but it's also to address what you said, like the privacy changes and building out data sets that are standardized so that you can do testing even when you don't know who an individual is. And, you know, the way, the way I think about it is, is that all that extra metadata that you can capture when it's standardized and it's accurate on a campaign or interaction with your site or coupons, all those little pieces of metadata are optimization opportunities, the ability to segment, the ability to deliver custom, customized personalization in all of your different, you know, you know, on your mobile apps and your web, you know, website experience. Without all of that data flowing through, you're going to be flying blind. So I think that there's a huge opportunity to, to standardize your metadata, create the rules, and really do some great things with your marketing still with that, that practice in place. Yeah. These things being said, what usually is a trigger for an organization to actually prioritize this? Because, yeah, yeah we talk about it. It sounds great. Not a ton of people are doing, not a ton of businesses are doing it. Um, so what, you know, what's the trigger? Yeah. Um, it's a good question. I think there's, there's multiple triggers that could occur. I think sometimes it's a new person joining an organization and they're, you know, curious. I'm guilty of it. I know a few companies that I've joined in the past within my first two weeks and like, what's that? Like, what, what are we doing here? Where's the, who runs this campaign? And, you know, I, I looked under the hood. Um, and then it's, you know, kind of what we were just talking about, about, um, you know, all the different changes to privacy. It's making people really look internally and look under the hood and look at their data structure and, um, so I think there's multiple factors that usually drive people to wanting to solve for their marketing taxonomy. Yeah. But usually it's like those two, but. 
Yeah, I wonder when you talk about a new person coming in, I imagine that like with the rise of chief digital officers, chief data officers, that one of their mandates when joining the organization is actually to reestablish some trustworthy data, you know, data and data quality within marketing and, and beyond marketing. We just we talk about marketing data because that's what we're closest to. That's what a lot of our customers are solving. And we're at, you know, this is a MarTech event. So we're going to stick with marketing. Yeah. So mandated to solve that and not only just the privacy changes, but the we talked about this earlier off camera. But when you have a campaign that you spend millions of dollars on and then, oh, by the way, we didn't track oh, this. Yeah. So that's happened. I'm sure that there's a number of people watching this right now where they're, they've been in a scenario where tracking was broken. They cannot you know, attribute any performance to that. And then when they're going, I mean, you said this, when they're going back to ask for budget, how do they justify it when they had no tracking in place to, to prove performance? So yeah. that's a big one as well. Yeah, you'd be surprised. It, it still surprises me to this day um, when I hear of clients or even friends, all my friends work in the industry where they go, yeah, we, we launched a campaign and didn't have any tracking on it. Like, oops. Yeah. I, yeah it's How hard, to, it's it hard to imagine. Cost? Yeah. It's hard to imagine savvy organizations letting that happen, but it does. It, yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine that happening. It's hard to imagine the lack in visibility from a tracking standpoint when they do track things. Um, I've learned to, to try not to be surprised at this point. That's um, fair. But, yeah. And we know not everything in marketing is trackable, but when it can be, you should make when sure that you... When it can be, you should make the right. most of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think the other thing besides the wasted spend, especially when you are tracking performance, is... Con I mean, content is huge these days. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the content that most businesses are pumping out is, you know, astronomical. And a lot of, a lot of times there's duplicate content being created, double effort. Things get lost. Nobody knows how to find things. So besides the campaign solved, there's a lot of problems solved with campaign or excuse me, content duplication and wasted time when you also are applying taxonomy because that taxonomy and those fields and values are stored in your DAM or your CMS. And then you can be able to, you're able to, when they're standardized, you can find those assets. Oh, when yeah. they're not, somebody has to go recreate them. I mean, we saw it um, like COVID is a great example when that was, you know, first the thing right. going into a year now. But um, marketers were shuffling. We heard of a few use cases of it um, where they're trying to pull assets um, yeah. and take them down. And I mean, the amount of time it was taking them was days. Like we don't have days. This is sensitive to the subject right now and we need it down now. Um, and unfortunately a lot of brands didn't have the ability for a quick turnaround. And I know they faced a lot of backlash in the media. Well, we were, you know, talking to a major retailer during this time when this all hit mm -hmm. and they, they totally understood marketing taxonomy, the application, what Clarivine did. And because of what you just described, they literally had to pull out of the discussions because they had to have all hands on deck yep. to pull assets out of market. And they couldn't even like that's how much time it was going to take them yeah. to do this because they didn't have a system in place, a taxonomy in place and standards in place to do it quickly. And there, you know, to pitch, there is a blog article and a video you did on mm -hmm. our site. Uh, around comprehensive digital ad metadata. So yeah. I would yeah, recommend people go check that out too. Mm -hmm. Of course. The other thing I was going to mention that as you were talking about um, what triggers organizations to you know get a hold on the taxonomy or implement a taxonomy, um, as you see it popping up more and more now is organizations are hiring taxonomists. So that's like a de another dedicated role in addition to the chief digital officer roles um, that we're seeing in organizations that, you know, they're, they're obviously noticing issues within their data so much so that they have roles just dedicated to figuring this stuff out for them. Right. And the other complementary piece to that is info architects. Mm -hmm. So that is a, 
like they're coming back because yeah. people are trying to create all this connected content, connected campaigns and everything else we described. And so info, info architects now in the digital world have become, you know, extremely valuable to what we're, what we're describing too. Yeah. Totally. And, and I do believe on the side that some taxonomists might argue what we call a taxonomy isn't a taxonomy, but we can, they can they can reach out to us after this video. And they we can, can take it up with <laughs> Google and Wikipedia. If you Google taxonomy, yeah, it's still a fucking thing. I think yeah. we're right. Okay. Definitely. Um, so all things considered, we kind of talked about what it is, the value, um, what triggers. Let's talk about where to get started. So um, in the asset library of this conference, we actually have an 18 page guide that talks about how to do this. But let's kind of let's kind of summarize the steps and, um, you know, starting from the top. Yeah. Um, so I, at the very top, it's identifying who who your stakeholders are. So if we're talking specifically about our marketing taxonomy, um, you want to know who runs email who runs search, social, display? Are there agencies involved? Um, so who needs to be part of the conversation? Because at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to implement a marketing taxonomy effectively without the practitioner buy-in, right. right? Because th that's what I always tell like clients when we're onboarding, because they're always curious. How long is this going to take? And, you know, what's, what's the ATA? I say the hardest part of implementation is people in process. Right. Because we can, I mean, as you know, Clarivine, you can get up and running in a day. If, right. You know, um, but it's really the people, um, we can build the best tool in the world, but if they're not using it, then it's all for not. Right. Um, so getting, identifying who those stakeholders are, um, step one. Um, and then having individual, what I call like discovery sessions with each of those stakeholders. And really the goal of those sessions is to understand not, it's, it shouldn't be a conversation of, oh, just send me, you know, what your tracking codes are right now and what the structure is. The goal of those conversations is to really understand what their workflow is to identify, are there any pain points that we can sort of alleviate? in this process, um, why do you capture budget owner? What value does that provide you? Um, having that conversation early on in the process, I have found it, it helps with the adoption because one, you're getting them involved so they feel like what they're saying matters because it does. Yeah. Um, but then also showing empathy for, for what they do. Um, I've worked as a marketer. Um, applying tracking codes was an afterthought. Right. Um, so just showing a little bit of empathy also um, for what they do. And you're really there to listen and ask questions and just to understand um, what is gonna be valuable to them because the last thing you wanna do is make an assumption and then try and throw that on their plate that they have to now you know, track something that's totally irrelevant to them and doesn't provide any value. Um, so those discovery sessions are what I would consider the most critical part. Um, from there, you can kind of draft a proposal for the data that you want to capture. Um, with that, you're really looking to draw any sort of correlation across the different channels. So if I'm capturing um, audience segment or segment type. Um, and I oversee email is social capturing something similar. Um, so drawing some parallels to try and consolidate. So it's not so specific to each channel. Um, sure. you're going to have some channel specific fields, but I always try and at least have, you know, five standard business required fields or core fields as I call them. Um, so that no matter what channel you're looking at, what region, what agency, you at least have those five fields that are sort of consistent across uh, departments. Um, and then from there, you just sort of build out the proposed structure, um, review it with each of those stakeholders that you had previously had conversations with. 
um, and then you'd build it out in Clarivine or in an Excel document. Um, and is this the data dictionary? Is that what you're talking about here? Yeah, Kobe? yeah. Just sorry. want to reference the guide that people might yes. go read after, like data dictionary is one of the deliverables. In yeah, okay. yeah. So when you uh, when you're drawing those parallels after the discovery session, um, well, really, it's in the discovery sessions that the data dictionary kind of starts getting built. Okay. Um, I started doing it just because it was helpful for me. I'd have like one row of data that was collected from the email team. This is with like with my notes and stuff. And then the next row would be for social and display just because having them kind of stacked like that is helpful. Sure. And then when you revise it for the actual deliverable, that turns into your data dictionary. Okay. In When you're creating these, you know, all these fields, the join fields, like the business level, the channel specific, when you're building this data dictionary, is are you defining the field types at that point? Like are these, because ultimately you're wanting to get to standards and, and whatnot, but are you defining field types at this step or is it kind of open-ended at that point? Yeah, so that's where, I mean, usually, usually they know up front if something could be like a pick list right? Yeah. with okay. some set values. Um, but sometimes there are some fields that are like TBD, I'll call it. Um, where I'll take that and still build out sort of in Clarivine uh, something tangible to sort of run through. Okay. Because what I've found is that even though we have it all documented in that like Excel or Google Sheet, um, showing them the functionality in Clarivine helps them sort of brainstorm on their own. Like, oh, well, if we can do that like that, can we change this to a filtered list or a dependent list as we call it. Um, so yeah, so some of the field types are defined, um, but, but not entirely, it doesn't have to be. Um, and again, that's also like worth noting that that's one of the benefits or yeah, benefits of Clarivine is that it, it allows you to be agile like that. Cause that's sure. also how I preface a lot of those discovery sessions and even the walkthrough, it's like, this is not set in stone. This is iterative. We can expand upon it. We can change values. And we have all of the data here in this central place. Um, so it's by no means like this is set in stone. This is what you guys are going to use. And we're never changing it until like four years. Um, I think that's yeah. a really important point because you talked earlier about their, the question of how long it takes. Mm -hmm. Well, it takes as long as you want it to, if you want to get to a usable foundation, understanding that it can grow. It's a, this, this is not, yeah. this is not a static thing. It is yeah. constantly evolving. It's interesting. I see what happens when people start building it and applying it, like, you know, when they're using our technology. All of a sudden, there's a lot of like mental associations happen, like realizations like, oh, this does this. That means that could also do this. Mm -hmm. And then they start this, this, this ability to see the interconnectedness and the value of these of standardized data sets. It's basically marketers really starting to realize the value of relational, relational databases mm -hmm. and how that impacts their advertising, their marketing, their content, all these things. So yeah. it's, it's a it's, it's really fascinating how that, that happens. Totally. Well, and that's, I mean, that's another reason to have the marketers involved um, early on in the process and getting their hands in the tool even, just because it does help get them excited. And when they're more excited, they're more invested and more likely to use whatever it is that taxonomy you choose um, for their marketing tactics. Right. And they're excited not just because we've simplified their process, but we've freed up some time for them to actually do marketing. Yeah. You know, people, the do ability to want. come back and actually do the things that they wanted to do because mm -hmm. a lot of the data issues are going away because it's all, it's all managed in a standardized, simple way. So, yeah. Um, and that's just, that's the application of a taxonomy. I mean, yeah, Clarivine does that well, but I think that I'm just generally speaking, when marketers kind of standardize their data and apply the taxonomy that they're they're better off. Yeah. It sounds easy what we just talked about, but what are super, <laughs> super easy. What are some challenges companies face when they're actually doing this? Like what what are blockers? What are hiccups along the way? 
That's a great question. Um, so people in process, I mean, is, is number one. Yeah. Um, it could be that they just like, they just don't understand or feel the need to use another tool. They don't see the value of, um, what, what's in it for them. Mm -hmm. They don't fully understand that answer. Um, so I'd say people in process and then like, I mean, even along those lines, responsiveness, attentiveness, like those discovery sessions, I tell people, I am going to take a lot of your time over the next two weeks. But if you give me those two weeks, I'll be out of your hair. You don't have to worry about it again. We're good. Um, but if those sessions are drawn out, um, you know, implementation can take a lot longer. Um, outside of that, I would say not knowing their own technologies. Um, I've come across organizations that use a CRM system or an ESP that they had no clue about. Um, the only reason they knew is because I was doing some auditing and found some links out there and they had no idea where they came from. Hmm. Um, so that happens as well and definitely will throw a wrench in things or uh, agency involvement or partner involvement. Um, if a client is working with an agency and doesn't really understand the process that the agency uses, yeah. um, now we're asking for time, not just from the social marketer internally, but we're also asking for time from their ad agency, which usually is fine. It's just more hands in the pot. Yeah. Um, and then I'd say last is probably just gaining alignment on what they want the input values to be. Um, and I'm talking again at like a global scale, getting alignment on values for audience segment, for example. Um, there's oftentimes questions like, why, how do we interpret this field? Like, what do you mean by audience segment? What is that the segment that we're emailing to, or is that the segment of the, um, content that's within the email? Cause those are two different things. I'm like, oh, that's a really good question. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, the, those are probably the three, three big areas where, where I see challenges the most. I imagine talking about that, like change management is like a huge, yes. like if you do it right, it's a huge benefit. Have you seen, I'm not sure if you have, but have you seen any companies like implement this with like a really successful change management? Like how do they, how do they get this up and running? Yeah. I mean, it's Under Armour. Yep. Um, I mean, at a global scale, they've, had and i mean it's kind of a pat on my back because i <laughs> i did the implementation but yeah. i say it's pretty good Definitely. um but yeah they they did a tremendous job getting um internal buy-in just everyone was excited about getting their taxonomy in order and i'm talking about the marketers and the practitioners um who are using the data for analysis and they're constantly asking me questions like, can I pivot my data by this or like this? I'm like, yeah, yeah, you can. Um, so I think they've done a pristine job of just one, the implementation and just the alignment internally um, for the direction that they wanted to go. Um, and then from a change management standpoint, um, just because they did such a good job with the internal alignment at implementation, um, there's just, there's the alignment and understanding in the process. So if a change does happen, the teams are aware of who needs to know what and where the data lies because all of the data is in Clarifying. Mm -hmm. If anything were to change, we have the versioning all yeah, in there. Right. So it's all, it's just, it's become a central repository for all of their metadata. Christine, thank you so much for joining us today and answering all these questions. Absolutely. Very helpful. And Absolutely. I'm sure the audience appreciates it as well. 
And I want to thank everybody who watched this session and please reach out to us and Clarivine if we can answer any questions for you. Thank you so much.